wonderful to, to welcome you all to the, um, the latest in um, the program of online lectures um, from the British Institute for the Study of Iraq. Um, I'm Paul Collins, I'm the current chair of trustees and it's my huge pleasure um, to welcome you um, this evening and to introduce our speaker, Dr. Moudi al-Rashid. Um, before I, I say a little bit more about uh, uh, Moody. Um, I just want to say a few words about the Institute for those of you who may be new to uh, these talks and indeed um, to the Institute itself. The British Institute for the Study of Iraq or, or BISI, BC, is one of the British International Research Institutes based at the British Academy in London. And we're devoted to the research and education across the arts, humanities, and social sciences on Iraq. I, of course, would encourage you to join us as a member. Um, and you can find out more about us by visiting our website on bisi.ac.uk. And of course, in becoming a member, you can find out about all our other activities and all our other talks. And um, they are all given by brilliant speakers and tonight is certainly no exception. Um, I'm confident that um, this talk will generate questions. Um, so um, please do type any that occur to you using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. So if you use your, your arrow um, cursor, to the bottom of the screen, you'll find um, the opportunity to type in a question and I'll ask Moody those questions at the end, should there be time. We will need to bring um, this evening's talk to a close at seven o'clock just uh, because of other commitments, um, but there should be time to explore many of our, these issues. So um, without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Moody Al-Rashid. Moody is a junior research fellow at the University of Oxford Wolfson College, where she specializes in the cuneiform script, languages and history of ancient Mesopotamia. She's written for academic journals and serves on the management committee of the Nahre Network, a partner of the British Institute and a project based at University College London, which supports Iraqi experts to research their own local cultural heritage. And uh, more importantly, in many ways for us, that Moody is the trustee of the British Institute. Um, she may, however, be known to many of you um, through her outreach and public history work. And um, she has written for popular journals widely, like History Today. Her Twitter account has almost 30,000 followers. And she has appeared on several podcasts, including the BBC's Making History and You're Dead to Me. And through these aims and very evidently achieves, um, gives ancient Mesopotamia as wide an audience as possible and to humanize its long history. Um, we are all eagerly awaiting the publication of her book forthcoming, The Princess and the Key, which promises to reveal, and I quote, aspects of Mesopotamian society and culture from war to education and language, from women's rights and the divine, to religion and the divine." Unquote. But this evening, I'm thrilled to say she will be talking to us about an area that she is really a great expert. Uh, the title of her talk, High, Low and Broken Hearts, Expressing Mental Distress in Ancient Mesopotamia. Thank you, Moody, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a generous introduction um, and for um, for having me this evening. I'm thrilled to get to talk to all of you today about the heart um, or is it the heart? I guess we can decide by the end of the talk. Um, so I'm going to be giving quite a lot of background. Um, 
the, the first part of the talk is basically going to be dedicated to that. Um, the idea being so that anyone who's joining from any discipline or anywhere in the world will be able to know what's going on in these texts by the time um, I finish the talk. Um, so I'll talk about context, what Mesopotamia is, what cuneiform is, what we mean by cuneiform scholarship, and more specifically, cuneiform medicine. We'll then move on to medical metaphors um, and asking that basic question of what a metaphor actually is um, before moving on to metaphor in cuneiform medicine, and specifically metaphors that employ an Akkadian word libu that I'll be translating as heart um, and how those metaphors help express uh, and make sense of mental distress. Um, the specific examples we're gonna look at are a broken libu and a low libu, as well as raising a low libu. So that, hence the title high, low and broken hearts, but sort of in reverse. Um, okay, so let's start with some background so that we can orient ourselves in time and space. So ancient Mesopotamia, um, it comes from the Greek between the rivers, and actually in Arabic has uh, the same meaning, bilad al rafidain countries of the two rivers. And the two rivers referenced are the Tigris and Euphrates, which flow through what is now Iraq, all the way up into Syria and parts of Turkey. Um, it, ancient Mesopotamia refers to a region, not a civilization, not a one single civilization. Um, and that region saw the rise and fall of several civilizations and cultures. Um, so many of you may be familiar already with Sumerians, Akkadians, Assyrians and Babylonians in the slightly later periods. And then in the last centuries of cuneiform, uh, of the use of cuneiform, there is the Achaemenid or Persian, um, Hellenistic and Parthian empires as well. So it was really home to quite a, a diverse um, range of um, civilizations, cultures, languages, um, many of which had in common um, the cuneiform writing system. Uh, so just a map, um, it's surprisingly difficult to find a good map <laughs> of ancient Mesopotamia, but this is uh, this is a quite, a quite a good one because it shows the modern uh, countries that um, uh, these ancient sites reside in. And it also shows the, um, I think uh, it's accurate, the ancient shoreline of the Persian Gulf, um, which is um, reaches all the way up to where you see Ur, Uruk, and Lagash, um, importantly. So um, uh, it sort of starts a little bit further north than it does today. Um, but you can also see here the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and these uh, cities and villages clustered around the rivers, the two rivers that make up Mesopotamia. And this is just another map, um, which is quite old actually, but I chose it because it, it shows Sumer and Akkad, which are the uh, civilizations or cultures of the third millennium, fourth and third millennium uh, BCE, uh, uh, BCE Akkad sort of um, coming onto the scene in the middle of the third millennium BCE. And then in uh, later periods, Babylonia and Assyria, um, all divided sort of south and north of the region. Uh, a little bit more terminological background. Um, uh, so when we're talking about the first half of the second millennium BCE, so 2000 to 1600, um, these are the old Babylonian and old Assyrian periods in the south and north, respectively. Um, in the next half of that millennium, we're talking about the middle uh, Babylonian and Assyrian periods. And in the first millennium, we move on to the Neo-Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian period. So this is a little bit boring, but I, I wanted to put everything together in one little table um, to show geography and, and time periods, because I will be using some of these terms throughout, uh, just so that you know, what, uh, I, will, I will remind you of the time periods um, as, as and when, but just to give an idea of, um, of the terminology, which also match up to script stages and dialects of the Akkadian language in, partic in particular, one of the languages that cuneiform was used to record. We are gonna focus on texts from these two periods um, in the first millennium BC with a couple of outliers. Um, what Again, what these periods and peoples have in common is their use of a writing system on a medium that's so durable that hundreds of thousands of texts have survived the passage of time to provide us a window on many aspects, but not all aspects of life in ancient Mesopotamia. 
Okay, so what is cuneiform? Um, cuneiform is a writing system, not a language. Um, and it's a writing system that, as mentioned, was shared by the civilizations of this region that was in use for a very long time. So from around 3350 BCE, and the last um, cuneiform tablet was uh, written, the last datable cuneiform tablet uh, is from 79 to 80 CE. Um, we're gonna look at a photo of that in a second. Cuneiform culture is a term used in the field that kind of sort of refers to the shared culture that's produced and maintained and eventually innovated by scribes and scholars of cuneiform, sometimes called a text community. And um, it, they're, the texts they produce show a shared way of understanding and organizing the world, but that um, that view is limited to the literary segments of society. So these aren't texts that we're gonna be looking at that don't, they don't reflect uh, necessarily the wider views, uh, the views or understandings of the wider population. That's something that we may um, never be able to access, but they do give us a nice window onto at least something. Um, the present investigation as mentioned is limited to texts produced by scholars from around 1000 to 500 BCE. Um, the word cuneiform in English comes from the Latin cuneus, which means wedge. I don't actually know Latin and I've never checked that, but that's what everyone says, so we'll go with it. Um, interestingly, in Arabic, the word for cuneiform also uh, reflects something visual about the script. It's mismod, which comes from nail, like nail markings, fingernail markings. And if we go even, uh, if we go further back to the Akkadian language, which is one of the languages that cuneiform was used to record and that all the texts we're gonna be looking at today are recorded in, the word for wedge was shataku or shantaku, which means triangle. So even uh, the original uh, references to the script um, relied on something about the way it looked, which I think is pretty cool. On the left is a one of the a tablet from one of the earliest periods um, in which writing gets developed, uh, the Uruk period at the end of the fourth millennium BC, and you can sort of see that signs are traced here instead of impressed to create those characteristic wedges, and they look a lot like things um, like vessels or I feel like I see a fish or something there or a foot, um, whereas later texts you have this more schematized wedge shape writing. And on the right is the last datable um, known cuneiform tablet, which is an astronomical almanac recording observations um, of things going on in the sky from 79 to 80 um, CE. Interestingly, uh, both come from Uruk. Um, okay, so what do cuneiform tablets look like? We often picture this iPhone shaped and sized um, pillowy uh, clay tablet, and a lot of tablets do look like that. Um, but they don't always look like that, and they certainly don't look like that when they're found. So clockwise from uh, the left, we have um, cuneiform tablets found in situ at the moment of excavation. Um, the top right is one of my favorite pictures. It's of a tablet at the John Rylands Library, and that's sort of what it looks and feels like um, when you're working with something that's just been excavated. A lot, a lot of work goes into putting these together, cleaning them up, and um, making sure they don't fall apart again so that you get something like uh, the image in the bottom right. Um, it's a bit like a 3D puzzle um, that, that reveals some really interesting stuff. Um, tablets can have many shapes. So on the left is a pyramid shaped label from the end of the third millennium BC, uh, the Ur III or Royal Dan Dynasty of Ur period, third dynasty of uh, Ur period with a seal impression that interestingly also appears on another tablet, quite unique. Um, the top right is a cone shaped uh, document which would have been buried in the foundation of a building so it kind of mimics architectural features without actually having an architectural function um, and this would have something like a dedication to um, a god um, from a particular ruler who built that building or um, specifically temple and on the bottom right is a prism um, that's about that tall uh, in the Ashmolean Museum that is called the Sumerian King List that lists uh, kings and their reigns, including uh, Gilgamesh, who reigned for over 100 years in the city of Uruk, according to the list. On the left is a lovely circular tablet that shows us what the sky looked like on the 3rd to 4th of January, 650 BCE. 
On the top right is a barrel shaped um, clay document that would have also been buried in a building foundation. And on the bottom right is a hand which lists the titles of Ashur Nasir Paul II, a Neo-Assyrian king. So there's quite a lot of variety, um, although the majority of um, what we work with uh, in scholarly, I mean, all of them more or less are um, your typical tablets that you uh, might picture. Cuneiform is also written on stuff other than clay. So on the left is a cil cylinder seal about the size of your thumb. Um, and cylinder seals are made of many different kinds of stones are really quite beautiful uh, with a relatively long um, inscription on it. On the top right is a boundary stone also with a long inscription and quite a lot of iconography along the top and on the other side as well. And the bottom right is a close up of a relief, a Neo-Assyrian relief from the palace at Nimrud that's also covered in quite a lot of cuneiform. Um, the, so uh, the, again, the tablets that we're gonna be looking at come from a specific subset, but it's, I think it's important to know what cuneiform is used for other than um, these scholarly texts and the material objects that, that carry the, this information um, that we rely on to reconstruct so much of Mesopotamia's history. Um, moving on now to cuneiform scholarship, um, <clears throat> we, there are several different genres of scholarly texts that get produced by scholars in ancient Mesopotamia, in particular in the first millennium BC. It doesn't sound particularly scholarly to a kind of modern listener, but omens uh, were done in a very systematic, uh, structured way, both the taking of them and the reading of them. Um, and I would say that firmly puts them in sort of history of science and scholarship. Lexical texts, um, it's a fancy way of saying lists um, or dictionaries. They were used um, in a lot of analogical reasoning um, that um, makes up much of cuneiform scholarship, which we won't get into, but is very interesting. Um, astronomical texts, um, one of my favorite <laughs> subset, um, there are textbook-like texts um, and observation texts that um, were just to record night after night um, observations of uh, astronomical phenomena from the position of planets to the appearance of eclipses. Um, I put these little examples here for anyone who wants to ask questions about um, specifics or Google stuff later, because some of these things are really interesting. Um, and then eventually in the last half of the first millennium BC, mathematical astronomy texts, which rely on a lot of the earlier traditions to um, construct mathematical formulae to make those calculations. Um, scholarly letters I've included here because we're gonna look at a few of them. They're basically letters from scholars to kings um, uh, detailing different observations and uh, using quite a lot of terminology from the medical texts. Um, scholarly commentaries, uh, which we won't get, get into, but they basically explain obscure stuff in the scholarly texts. And finally, um, last but not least, medical texts. Um, so <clears throat> cuneiform scholarship um, is produced, it, the, these are texts produced in narrow circles of the scholarly community, mostly by men scholars, though there are some women scholars attested as well. Um, some of these texts qualify as canonical. In other words, there are standard versions that get copied for centuries. Um, and for our purposes, the focus will be on the first millennium BCE, but these traditions have roots in the second, second millennium BCE. Um, the texts are copied and used by apprentices and professional scholars, including medical professionals, um, which we will, um, we will look at in a little while once we get to the um, therapeutic texts in particular. Um, so we have to keep this context in mind for lots of reasons, but in particular, so we don't try to universalize from the texts we're about to explore. And remember that they were written by a specific group of people, often for um, a specific demographic, like men in the palace administration who are really stressed out, for example. Um, but despite these limitations, they still provide insights into elements of the language used to organize and record experiences of distress and disease, and in particular, mental distress. Um, okay, moving on to cuneiform medicine. Um, there are a couple kind of basic categories of medical texts um, uh, that we're going to look at a few examples of. Um, the first category is diagnostic texts. And in particular, there's something called the canonical diagnostic handbook, which basically means a standard textbook, uh, more or less, that records symptoms and diagnoses. Um, 
the, these are known from first millennium BCE copies, but were likely written down earlier and certainly have earlier kind of forerunners uh, from the middle Babylonian period. The name for the series in Akkadian is Sakiku, which basically translates to symptoms. To me, more interestingly, there are also therapeutic texts, including a um, canonical one known as the Therapeutic Handbook that's still being pieced together. Um, but there is a lot more diversity in the therapeutic texts, and they seem to be innovated more frequently. Um, they can be thematically organized, um, like those for a particular, uh, an illness with a common cause, such as witchcraft or ghosts, um, illnesses with a common domain, like gynecology, um, or illnesses that uh, center on a particular body part, like the head or the stomach. Um, other sources for to, that help us reconstruct medical traditions are medical catalogs. A catalog is basically like a detailed table of contents that uh, modern scholars use to reconstruct multi-tablet works like the Diagnostic Handbook, which is 40 tablets long. Um, they're normally stored separately um, and they sort of fill in blanks in broken uh, texts or broken series. Um, there have been catalogs found both to therapeutic and diagnostic series. Um, medical commentaries, which, which form part of the scholarly commentary tradition that we won't get into, I would include letters as a good source for uh, the study of medicine in Mesopotamia and lumping a whole bunch of stuff under other. Um, these include, for example, hymns to the healing goddess Gula, who's pictured here on the left with her dog, which is her attribute animal. In her hand, in one of her hands, she holds what looks like a scalpel, which uh, are referenced in hymns to her. Uh, which is referenced in hymns to her, and possibly in the other hand, that circular thing might be some kind of bandage. Um, so th this list is not exhaustive, the diagnostic, therapeutic, catalogs, commentaries, letters, and other. Um, there are many sources that can tell us about medical theory and practice, um, which I've just lumped together here as other. But what I want to stress are that, is that there are a lot of sources um, for the reconstruction of medical theory and practice. Um, this is something that tends to surprise people when I tell them I research medicine in ancient Mesopotamia. They usually quip that there must only be a sort of handful of texts, uh, when actually there are thousands of texts but only a handful of scholars <laughs> looking at those texts. So um, this brief background gives us enough uh, to begin our investigation uh, of the heart um, momentarily. Uh, but I do, of course, want to give a few more um, sources for medicine. So archaeology is another place to look for medical theory and practice. Uh, healing temples, for example, uh, the dog temple to Gula at Isin, where uh, so named because the um, remains of, I think, 30 dogs were found buried there. Um, artifacts, uh, we're actually going to kind of go backwards because I, I, I'm not very good at slides. Um, so uh, there are figurines that were that are referred to a lot in therapeutic texts, and some of these texts include drawings of those figurines. Um, this is a figure of a ghost on the left being led away by a companion that's been created by the ritual to lead the ghost um, into the underworld so that it can stop bothering and causing medical problems for a particular person. Um, the, um, and this is um, discussed in Irving Finkel's new book, The First Ghosts, if anybody's interested in, in learning more about it. Um, fig actual figurines have been found, such as dog figurines associated with the healing goddess, but also f healing figurines, um, which may reflect the body part that um, a person is uh, seeking help with. And finally, surgical tools have been found, um, and surgery is referenced in, for example, legal text and elsewhere. Um, so uh, these are surgical tools from Babylon, uh, and this is my really bad picture of a picture from a book called Ancient Mesopotamia Speaks um, that was published a couple of years ago uh, by the Yale Babylonian Collection. Um, medical texts from ancient Mesopotamia go back way further than the period that we're looking at. Um, on the left is a therapeutic text from Ebla in what is now Syria from about 2400 BCE. And this is actually not the earliest known medical text. Um, it's a list of prescriptions. It has three prescriptions and they're, um, so it would be an example of an early therapeutic text. Uh, the first and third ones name plants and their applications, so the ailments that they're meant to treat. And the second one um, gives uh, kind of directions for a mixture of plants and other products um, and its therapeutic application. 
On the top right is an old Babylonian, so 2000 to 1600-ish BC, treatment for a feverish mouth. Um, the photos by Klaus Wagensoner, who is the source of many photos in this um, presentation. And um, on the bottom right is a Neo-Assyrian letter from a physician named Urad Nanaya to the king with instructions to treat a rash with bird fat. So quite a range, both in time and topic. Um, just briefly, um, because I can't really give a, a talk about medicine in Mesopotamia without telling you a little bit about the diagnostic handbook, even though we're not going to look at examples from it. Um, it's a really interesting work. It's made up of 40 tablets divided into six chapters, of which tablets 3 to 14 are arranged from head to toe. So that's an interesting kind of forerunner to um, later texts from other, um, from Greece, for example, that arrange things from head to toe. Um, and again, it's known from first millennium manuscripts, but probably has an earlier origin and forerunners. It's, it only describes symptoms, diagnoses, causes, and prognoses. Um, the way things are phrased are typical of scholarly texts in general, which employ if-then statements. So if, and then a description of symptoms, followed by then a diagnosis, cause, and prognosis, or at least one of these things, not always all of them. The best way I think to illustrate this is with an example. Um, if a fit overwhelms him and spittle falls from his mouth, it is antashuba, which um, has, is often translated as epilepsy. And this is known as the epilepsy tablet because it records symptoms um, that resemble what is categorized as epilepsy today. Um, but we are gonna focus on therapeutic texts. Um, simply because they are a little bit more informative and there's a little bit more variation and you get information about treatments from these, which is missing from the diagnostic handbook. Um, so uh, in terms of structure, there's some, some form of diagnostic introduction to them that describes the symptoms. This can be really, really lengthy or very brief, just one symptom. Um, there's usually a diagnosis plus or minus a cause. And then a treatment, which um, can be very, very elaborate and involve both, um, you know, something that might be familiar, familiar to us today in modern biomedical settings, like um, band bandages and medications, and stuff that is less familiar, like um, incantations and rituals, all of which work together to treat uh, medicine, and we will revisit that shortly. Um, in terms of form and language, they match up to much um, of the other texts from the scholarly corpus in their use of if-then statements, but they also include instructions like you grind X, Y, and Z, you mix it with beer, you recite. Um, so they were clearly meant for use by someone who needed these instructions to carry out various treatments. Um, they show quite a lot of variation and innovation. Um, they're varied in format, length, and content, and some of them even refer to tested remedies, suggesting the experiment, uh, experimentation figured in uh, the final uh, therapies chosen and recorded. Um, so uh, clock against just a few examples on the top left is a, just a sh short list of medical ingredients. On the bottom left is the frag fragment for treating ghost-induced illness. And on the right is a monster of a tablet, a four-column tablet with treatments for gynecological ailments that include amulets and suppositories. So a lot, a huge range of texts. Some of them were also copied by apprentices or students in the very late stages of their career. Um, this, for example, is an exercise tablet with a therapeutic prescription against witchcraft that includes a list of ingredients. Um, uh, so again, just as, as we mentioned earlier, the collections are often arranged according to some common denominator. Um, for example, illnesses caused by witchcraft or pregnancy related symptoms, fevers, symptoms on a particular part of the body, etc. Some of them are just lists, some are huge compendia of plants, um, and some are general compendia of treatments, the therapeutic handbook mentioned earlier. Here's an example of one, so we can get an idea of what is in these. For irregular bleeding, you grind together these 20 plants, kalu mineral, kalguku mineral, alum, magnetic hematite, um, silver, gold, black anzachufrit, and tongue of a field mouse. You mix it with honey, ghee, and calf fat. You recite the incantation three times over it, and then you rub it gently on her umbilical area. <clears throat> So what can we learn about medical practice from this 
one very random example um, already. So treatments include magical in quotes and medical remedies. Magical in quotes because it wouldn't have been considered separate from medical um, in ancient Mesopotamia, but for our purposes, I'm separating them out just to make it a little bit more clear. Um, these include things like incantations, rituals, amulets, etc. so magical objects. And then medical remedies. Um, so these range from fumigation, suppository salves, rubs, uh, drinks uh, mixed with beer. And they're used in combination. They are not separate theoretically or practically. Um, they're administered by two main medical professionals and there's quite a lot of overlap in what these uh, people do. The Asu, which is traditionally translated as physician. The Ashipu or Mashmashu, traditionally translated as exorcist, which is not without its many problems. Um, and I've added just because the previous the examples from gynecological corpus, a midwife, a Shabsutu, um, uh, who, um, uh, isn't one of the sort of main medical professionals, but deserves being on this list. You can read more um, in this wonderful open access book by Dr. Uh, Trolls Pank Arbel, Medicine and Ancient Asher, for anyone who wants to learn more about this, because this is very much a whistle stop tour <laughs> of, um, of uh, medicine before we get to the texts themselves. Um, and just a little excursus on midwives. This is a seal from the early dynastic period. So it's really, really old, third millennium BCE that shows a woman giving birth um, and another woman, presumably, at, although there's no way to really confirm one way or another, um, kneeling before her, who may or may not be a, a midwife. There's no real evidence one way or another. Um, no, no text to confirm it for us. Um, OK, um, so um, now that we have a little bit of background on what where the texts were produced, what um, they say, um, what they tell us a little bit about the practice of medicine. We can turn more specifically to metaphor and the use of metaphor in these texts um, to express mental distress. Um, but, but before we talk about metaphor, well, let's figure out what, what it is and what definition will guide this um, discussion. Um, the most basic definition is expressing one thing in terms of another. There's no need to really rethink it. Lakoff and Johnson, who are often cited um, in um, studies of metaphor, um, and in particular in studies of metaphor and Assyriology, um, define it as understanding and experiencing one kind of thing, a primary subject, in terms of another kind of thing, a secondary subject. And those two subjects are one and the same. So for example, expressing illness as war, which may be quite familiar to all of us by now. Um, Illness is war is kind of constituted by the use of terminology, of, of war terminology in um, aspects of illness. So we fight a cold, uh, we win or lose a battle with illness. Front, there are frontline workers in the COVID pandemic in particular. A virus attacks the body or the body attacks itself. The US National Cancer Act of 1971 declared a war on cancer. Um, and if this is interesting, uh, please do see Susan Sontag's uh, study, Illness as Metaphor. Um, uh, just a few headlines. I literally just pulled these from the last couple of weeks. But using more metaphor here, Jesse J reveals COVID battle, NHS frontline staff battling Omicron COVID surge, struggling to cope in war zone, although I don't think that's used metaphorically uh, so much considering what they've been going through. And then this idea of surrendering to or defeating uh, COVID-19. Uh, so we see it a lot even now. Um, another example that uh, Lakoff and Johnson give is uh, an orientational metaphor of happy as being up and sad as being down. So we describe a low or depressed mood as sad and an uplifted one as happy. We talk about feeling down or having sunken spirits as opposed to having high spirits. We fall into depression, et cetera. So the question becomes, is it possible to kind of map this onto um, Akkadian words? And I think there's an important caveat to that. Um, and this is um, a quote from J. Kale Johnson's chapter from 2017, The Comparable Body. In spite of our natural and unfortunate predilection to confer edic status on metaphors we live by, it is very much an emic folk theory of late 20th century academic discourse. Um, so basically, even though the examples just given work well in English uh, for the 20th, 20th and 21st centuries, 
they may not be as easily mapped onto Akkadian examples. There is a tendency in the handful of studies on metaphor uh, in cuneiform texts uh, as on cuneiform medicine to rely uh, heavily on Lakoff and Johnson as an objective analysis of metaphor when it is firmly entrenched in its own academic context. Nevertheless, I think it's in interesting to raise um, and we are going to sort of evaluate things against it um, for the sake of having some, some kind of framework and maybe by the end of this decide it does work or it doesn't work. Uh, modern medicine relies on a lot of metaphor as well. Um, pain descriptors rely on metaphor, so burning or stabbing pain. And endometriosis pain in particular um, relies on a lot of metaphors to convey really just how much pain is involved. It can be described as a high temperature, as the insertion of a sharp object. <clears throat> Some um, One woman quoted in a HuffPost article describes it as a womb full of nails and daggers. And another title of an article by Stella Bullo quotes someone else that, who said, I feel like I'm being stabbed by a thousand tiny men. Um, so modern medicine relies on metaphor in the description of symptoms, as well as in the explanation of how a disease works and how a treatment might progress. It really helps um, demystify a lot of elements of the medical encounter. Um, and sometimes it reveals an underlying framework like illnesses were. Okay, but who cares? <laughs> That's a million dollar question. Metaphor in medical texts, as I understand it, may elucidate priorities in how symptoms were organized, um, experienced, and explained. For example, can we say that illness was conceived of as a war in ancient Mesopotamia? Was sad down as well? Um, are there other metaphors that help clarify the otherwise difficult to make sense of medical experience? Um, metaphor may help explain the rationale for certain treatments and their wording. So for example, in Akkadian, you get released from an illness rather than defeating it. Um, some of the texts we'll look at end with uh, treatments geared at lifting someone's low heart. Um, metaphor in scientific texts in general fill gaps in knowledge and help make the unknown more knowable. They allow for concrete objects and situations to stand in for abstract or not directly observable objects and situations. So for example, the use of uterus and birth canal metaphors in Akkadian gynecological texts to try to make sense of the uterus and birth canal during childbirth that are uh, not directly observable. Um, metaphors for mood sometimes spotlight phys physical organs. Um, so we do see some of this at play. Um, uh, so in general, metaphor and scientific texts like medical texts from ancient Mesopotamia can tell us how people organized and understood medical experiences in a common domain of inquiry, which is the human body. Um, they provide some of the earliest written insights into how people made sense of the body, and more specifically for our purposes of moods within that body. We can finally get to metaphor in cuneiform medicine. Um, so. Um, metaphor and medical texts. So, um, there have been a couple studies of this. I'm actually going to sk skip this slide because I don't want to not have time for questions. Um, but I'm going to give an example of a gynecological text that employs metaphor in a way that is not trivial. Um, so it says, wording of an incantation to stop a woman's blood. May her canals be blocked. It's ritual. By a canal, you dig a hole. Toward the west, a water skin, you block up its opening with clay mixed with chaff. You say, the road is blocked. You seal its opening with a seal of carnelian. <clears throat> canal and water metaphors in gynecological texts don't just reflect literary preferences. They provide concepts of the body that constrain and determine treatment options. And they help make sense of something not directly observable by a medical professional or even the person experiencing the symptoms. Um, they figure in the treatments on different levels as well in terms of language. They figure into the incantations and rituals, but they also transcend language and sometimes provide um, the setting or materials for a particular ritual. Finally, the heart met metaphors. So the word we're translating as heart is libu in Akkadian, and it has many translations based on context. It doesn't correspond to any single organ or body part consistently and seems to have um, uh, the ability to think and feel. So it can be angry or calm. It can be afraid, joyful, disturbed, trouble. It can think, it can speak with itself as a way of expressing thought, and it can plot. Um, as a physiological organ, it can refer to the heart that pulses or throbs. It can also refer to the stomach or parts of the stomach, the torso more generally, the insides, the womb, and even the penis. Um, it can also be used prepositionally to mean in or within. 
So it has a lot of meanings. It has a pretty, pretty wide range. Um, and it also figures uh, quite heavily in medical texts. So on the left is a therapeutic text that references the libu crying out with wind, in other words, flatulence. On the top right um, is a manuscript for the diagnostic handbook, uh, the 13th tablet that looks at all kinds of symptoms related to the stomach and its parts. And bottom right is a therapeutic text against divine anger that includes a symptom of the broken libu that we are gonna read an excerpt from now. If a man is constantly frightened, he worries <clears throat> day and night. He repeatedly suffers losses. His profit is cut off. People slander him. They spread rumors about him. People maliciously point at him. Being present in his palace, he is not well received. His dreams are terrifying. He keeps seeing dead people in his dreams. He suffers from heartbreak. The wrath of God and goddess is upon him. <clears throat> so we can distill from this um, a list of symptoms. It's describing someone who's constantly frightened and worried, suffering financial and reputational loss, having really bad dreams um, and nightmares, suffering from this chiplebi, which we're translating as heartbreak, and the cause is given as divine anger. There are a couple of other texts that list uh, really similar symptoms as well. So this isn't um, a unique grouping. Um, another text, um, and, and please ignore our horrible citation methods in Assyriology, I just didn't know how else to cite these. So BIM is just an acronym for a, a book series, and 316 is the text number. Um, if a man, his text, his text, his heart continually breaks, and on repeated occasions he is afraid, that man, anger of God and goddess is over him, his God is angry with him. And then a little further down, if he continually has pain, heartbreak, and grief, his heart ponders foolishness, and it's followed by an elaborate treatment. So again, to make a list, we have a heart that continually breaks as a verbal expression, fear, a broken heart, more fear, grief, a heart that ponders foolishness, and the cause is again, divine anger. Please forgive my use of a Venn diagram and the fact that I really don't know how to make these look nice, but I, did I just wanted to show some overlap here and where the main overlap is. So there are a couple of things that hint at um, problems with mood. But the one thing in common between these two texts is fear, described in a variety of ways, and the cause of um, the kind of etiology of the disease, which is divine anger. In another text, a person is described as having heartbreak, and again, bad dreams, um, seeing and speaking to dead people, having a low heart, which we're going to talk about shortly, a short temper, and being constantly frightened and restless. Um, we'll read the actual excerpt in a second, but I wanted to uh, add to my horrible Venn diagram, um, some more descriptions of mood, as well as highlighting again that one of the things, the, the thing in common is this description of fear, even though there are different causes at play and different other moods at play. It's important to note <clears throat> that none of these texts is one a disease, but they hint at patterns in the description of certain symptoms. This first point applies to therapeutic texts en masse, um, including the ones that we'll read for a low heart. Many examples of groupings of moods with a broken heart suggest it may be related to these experiences, in particular the use of different words for fear, for expressions for grief, and may be related experiences like nightmares, distractedness, confusion, and foolish thoughts. Um, this is an example from a scholarly letter by, uh, from Nabu Tabni Utsur, a scholar to the king. Um, if the king, my lord, knows a fault made by me, let the king not keep me alive. All my associates are happy, I am dying of, and I am dying of a broken heart. That's phrased differently from our expression. I have been treated as if I did not keep the watch of the king, my lord. My heart has become exceedingly troubled. Heartbreak has seized me. I have become exceedingly afraid. May the king revive my heart before my colleagues. So just another example of the broken heart. It might be a metaphor. It may stand in for an emotional state akin to anxiety, fear, depression, some combination <clears throat> with no exact equivalent in a biomedical model or modern English terminology for emotions. But it might also be a literal description of a feeling, a break associated with this constellation of moods that it typically appears with, especially fear. Maybe it's both, maybe it's neither. Let's move on quickly to a low heart um, and read a few more examples of these texts. So if a man has an adversary, his heart is frightened. He continually forgets his word or alternatively, his mind continually changes, which is an expression that basically means he goes mad. 
His heart is low, <clears throat> he causes his self fear, his heart ponders foolishness. In his bed, he is continually frightened or he is continually afraid. Another text um, describes someone whose heart ponders foolishness and mind continually changes again. He keeps forgetting his speech. Um, he has fever, stiffness, lip boo disease, and depression. This is a kind of typical grouping of diseases, so don't read too much into it. His dreams are confused and numerous. He continually sees dead people. He continually speaks to dead people. His heart is low. His temper is short. Um, so our beautiful Venn diagram, again, shows actually quite a lot of overlap in the symptoms described here um, with a low heart, um, including fear, madness, foolish thoughts, forgetfulness, and another word for depression, which is tadir too. Many of these reverse the metaphor um, by having therapy outcomes where um, the, the heart must be lifted. So maybe this reflects something like sad is down and happy is up, or maybe it, it's something else, something else is going on entirely. Um, but an example is from this um, therapeutic text that says his low heart will stand up again and again. Um, and another example, the low heart of the man will rise. So in the case of the last example, it does raise the question of whether or not a low heart might refer to problems with male libido, as libu sometimes stands in for penis. That's of course an option, but I think it's quite obvious when symptoms related to sex are intended. Um, there are references to things like discharge or not being able to raise the heart specifically towards a woman. Um, we don't really get any of these in the text we've looked at or in the excerpts from the therapies that reverse the low heart um, and aim to raise it, the, these particular excerpts. So I don't think that's what's going on. I think we're firmly in the, the territory of describing mental distress um, and emotional distress specifically. Um, another uh, scholarly letter worth quoting that uses this expression, um, as to what the king my lord wrote to me. So this is a letter from Adad Shumu Utsur, who was um, a medical professional in the Neo-Assyrian court. And he's now quoting a letter from the king in which the king wrote, my heart is sick. How did we act that my heart has become so low for this little one of mine? Presumably talking about being quite sad about an Ill illness in one of his children. And then the, the uh, Adad Shumun Utsur says, had it been curable, you would have given away half your kingdom to have cured it. But what can we do? Oh, King, my Lord, it is something that cannot be done. I think based on the context, um, it's fair to um, interpret a low heart as referring to a sad mood um, or a very distressed mood. Another letter from Adad Shumu Utsur, pleading on behalf of his son, Urad Gula, who had been banished from the court. <clears throat> so um, he describes all these people who were unwell or unhappy, um, who have been uplifted. And then he's, I just use that metaphor, who have, who have been um, uh, helped. And then he asks, why then must I and Urad Gula amidst them, our temper be short and our heart be low? So again, that's that short temper paired with a low heart, as we saw in the therapeutic text a little bit earlier. I know these were just a few examples with a bit of a slapdash introduction, and I, I do apologize for how rushed um, uh, it has been, but I do want to leave time for questions. But I think we can draw a few conclusions from the material explored so far, perhaps raising more questions than we answer. We can certainly say that medical expressions that employ the heart may represent metaphors for mood. Um, which then may provide insights into how these moods were physically experienced or embodied. So again, going back to Lakoff and Johnson um, with the understanding of limitations of their theories, one of um, the ways they account for the orientational metaphor of sad is down is by suggesting that bodily you know, um, positioning when you're sad is sort of hunched over slightly or slumped. Um, and that uh, might be the source of um, this metaphor. Um, Broke, a broken heart in some way expresses an experience that goes with fear, depression, and other descriptions of emotional states. And a low heart in some way expresses an experience of sadness. Um, these are open to interpretation and argumentation, of course, um, because I think more instances need to be explored along with the context of text production to decide how these expressions reflect physical experience of mood, if at all. Um, ultimately, it is clear um, that medical texts um, <clears throat> address experiences of mental distress, that much we can say for certain, and it's important to respect the original terminology and phrasing, including any metaphors being used, to better understand how mental distress, distress was expressed and understood. 
And I think it's important at the same time to try to fit these texts into the broader narrative of the history of medicine and the history of mental health and illness, which I think involves taking some intellectual risks and trying to interpret things um, in a way that um, might make might um, elucidate parts of those experiences. Um, it, uh, despite there being a very different context um, for the production of cuneiform scholarship and anything anyone writes today about mental distress, I wonder if there is some overlap, um, which brings me to my final point. The authors of these texts and the patients they ultimately based their writings on and used their writings for were people, after all. Um, the context might be different, but the few examples we've explored may suggest that there are some common denominators that briefly close the gap between the millennia and remind us that we're not alone in our experiences of heartache or low hearts, however that metaphor might be understood. Um, in the next few days, uh, coincidentally, an article on this um, that I wrote will be published in the journal AVAR. If anyone's interested, it's an open access journal and it'll be their inaugural issue. Um, and finally, I want to thank the British Institute for the Study of Iraq, not just for having me this evening, but for all the amazing work they do to facilitate, support, and promote <clears throat> research and public education about Iraq. It really is a privilege to get to work with them and to serve as a trustee. You can learn more on their website about their work and their Twitter account. Um, they have a lot of open access books um, as well on their website, as well as talks. Um, and um, they also offer research funding for various projects, including, as um, Paul Collins said at the beginning, um, ones that specifically support Iraqi scholars and researchers in collaboration with the Nahrain Network. Um, so thank you, BZ, for the wonderful work you do, for hosting me this evening, and thank you to everyone for listening. Moody, thank you very much indeed. That was a, a thrilling journey through an extraordinary range of material. Um, there are lots of questions coming in and I realize we've got only a short period of time, um, some 10 minutes, I'm afraid. So I'll try and get through as many as possible, but uh, apologies if um, we can't get to them all. Um, in fact, the first question that came in is, is a very big question and probably deserves uh, an entire lecture all on its all on its own, which is the um, how cuneiform um, was uh, translated. Um, so, if you could, um, from Isabel Juncker, um, how did the cuneiform writing system um, was recovered? So, if you have a a, a quick summary of of that, that'd be grateful. I'll try to do a very quick summary. It's an excellent question. Um, and it is not an easy one to answer because the archival material is still sort of being poured over to try to reconstruct it step by step. But if I had to uh, summarize it in one minute, um, trilingual inscriptions that were written in the cuneiform um, writing system found in what is now Iran and various sites, um, uh, early um, epigraphers and archeologists identified that basically these um, inscriptions said the same thing in three different languages, and they were able to identify some elements of the Persian language um, in those inscriptions and using those as a kind of opening uh, to understanding what the other, uh, the inscriptions in the other languages said. Um, these were then supplemented by cuneiform text, cuneiform tablets unearthed um, in Iraq around the same time. Um, but the big breakthrough came when I think it was um, Edward Hinks, Edwin Hinks, Edward Hinks, <laughs> um, um, was able to kind of make an index that matched the signs found on the tablets to the signs found on those trilingual ins inscriptions, effectively opening up thousands and thousands of texts um, to help people decipher the writing system. Um, it, uh, people weren't particularly confident about it in the beginning. So I think Rawlinson said that he thought that we would never be able to read Babylonian cuneiform, um, but thankfully uh, his pessimism was unfounded and, and now we, we can and uh, we can even read other languages written in cuneiform other than the ones um, from Babyl um, Babylonian texts. I hope that was made some sense. It's a really good question, but hard to answer. <laughs> right, thank you very much. Um, um, move on to a question from uh, Matilda Serengeli. Um, although you've been talking obviously around sort of uh, medical experience and emotions, there's a, uh, she asks a very specific question around um, 
uh, if there is any description of the herpes virus and if we know whether, well, interestingly, whether they use snail slime to heal mm. skin diseases. Interesting. I'll start with the first part. Um, so it's really difficult to correlate modern and ancient uh, diseases, even with um, something that might have a really straightforward observable set of symptoms. Um, but there are various skin conditions that are described, some of which may indeed um, refer to something like um, the herpes the herpes virus. Um, regarding the use of snails, I don't know. I haven't encountered it, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. That's a really interesting question. I, I want to now look go look it up and see if, if there are references. So, excellent question. Thank you. And then uh, Joanne Skerlock um, makes a point that mm -hmm. um, the, the broken heart is actually correctly translated, uh, a crushing sensation in the heart, mm -hmm. and is not a metaphor, but a description of stress angina, uh, mm -hmm. which is what angry gods cause. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, certainly. And that was one of the options I had on the slide of, of it not being a metaphor at all and just describing something going on um, physically in the torso um, that feels like it's breaking. But an excellent point. Um, Elizabeth Reisner um, says, oh, great talk, and, and she's curious for the symptoms of seeing dead people. Mm -hmm. Do any of the texts indicate what kind of dead people? Is it referencing someone they knew or um, other dead people? Um, another excellent question, a bit of both. So sometimes uh, it's they're described as seeing dead people, sometimes it's ghosts, um, and those ghosts or dead people can be dead relatives, they can be a, a dead stranger, they can be uh, ghosts who decide, died in a very specific way. Um, there's quite a lot of variety in um, the spirits that figure into um, causes uh, and symptoms of, of medical experiences. Um, if you're interested in this, um, uh, I did already refer to it, so it sounds like I'm trying to sell it, but um, The First Ghost by Irving Finkel, which I just read um, recently, which is why it's forefront of my mind, um, does talk about this quite a lot, uh, but also Joanne Skurlock, who uh, just asked a great question, has written a, a brilliant compendious uh, book of ghost-induced illness in Mesopotamian medicine that goes through a lot of these examples um, of, of seeing or, or speaking to or just otherwise being troubled by uh, the dead. Right, and we'll move on now. Uh, Megan Henning um, raises the question around fear as a common description and wonders whether it could be understood through the lens of disability studies as part of the way that able-bodied persons externalize their own anxieties and fears about disability into the bodies of the disabled. Hmm. That's a really interesting question and an interesting approach um, to understanding those symptoms. Uh, I think you can certainly try to understand it that way. There's um, there's really sort of no set way to interpret um, these texts. We have all the words, um, we have them together, we have the context, but um, there's there are always new and fresh ways to interpret them um, uh, from diverse perspectives. So I think that's certainly um, that's certainly a valid approach and a very interesting one. So thank you for raising it. Thank you and. Um, uh, Kimberly Wilson, um, uh, thanks you for your insights. And is there any indication in the text of the response of others to incidents of mental illness, or the stigma or compassion? Um, I think uh, the texts that um, we looked at today are are seem to have been produced for a specific segment of society that is um, ones that come into contact with palace administration in some way. Um, so I'm not sure that they were, they, I mean, there's no, I can't categorically say no. I think that's a really interesting question and, um, and possibility as well. Um, but I think um, that traditionally they're viewed as just um, understandings of, and, and ways to treat uh, the experiences of uh, pe people who are quite stressed or experiencing other kinds of metal dis med medical distress um, in that um, context. That's a really interesting um, question though. Uh, Nida Zada um, asks, have you seen indication of organizations created to help medical health situations? Mm. Um, there are certainly sort of healing temples uh, that a person could go to to, to seek um, help with uh, ailments that they were having, like uh, the temple Tagula mentioned um, er earlier. Um, but in terms of uh, kind of informal organizations, um, 
I don't know that I, I could be completely wrong. Again, I haven't read sort of every single text. Um, I don't know that the texts give us evidence of that, but that doesn't mean that something like that wouldn't have been wouldn't have been present. And we may find evidence of it, textual evidence of it at a later point in time. Um, so it's, it's very possible. And I think we just can squeeze in perhaps just um, maybe two more questions. Um, there's one from um, Denise Ilgaz. Um, is there a connection between medical texts and astronomical ones, such as planets that cause mental distress? Um, there certainly are in general. I'm not, um, I can't think of specific examples for mental distress, but in the last half of the first millennium BCE, when the zodiac gets developed, it gets used for much more than just organizing observations about stuff going on in the sky. It gets also mapped onto medical experiences, treatment timings, and parts of the body. So there is certainly a relationship between astronomy and medicine in the kind of final centuries of cuneiform culture that is very interesting to explore, and there may well be um, a sum that describe uh, mental distress that I'm just forgetting at this uh, particular moment in time. But that's a, a really good question and, and speaks uh, as well to the question of organization of knowledge more generally in the last half of the first millennium BC, which is itself a very interesting question, one that gets explored by Willis Monroe, I think very, um, Dr. Willis Monroe very uh, effectively and clearly if anyone's interested in reading more about that. Um, I think very sadly, despite some extraordinary interesting questions coming in, we probably do have to do, um, draw a close here. Um, there's a really interesting question around modern local dialects and how modern Iraqi ways of describing emotions, which uh, opens up a whole, whole new area of research potentially. So um, I'm sorry um, we've run out of time and thank everybody very much for those questions. Um, but particularly, I want to thank, of course, uh, Moody Al Rashid uh, for your extraordinary talk this evening. Uh, obviously, opening up a whole new area of study to um, a wider audience, and really, I think, um, fulfilling your your desire always to humanise um, ancient Mesopotamia achieved um, in an extraordinary manner this evening. So, um, huge thanks indeed on behalf of of. Uh, BC for um, this wonderful talk. Um, so thank you. Thank and you. Thank you me. all for, for, for joining us this evening. Um, and I hope very much um, to see you all again uh, very soon. Thank you.